No doubt one of the hottest topics in fishing right now is barrel trauma. And last year, stakeholders along with the Minnesota DNR worked on a pilot project to, to assess some of the issues that uh, crappie fisheries in particular might be facing with anglers targeting fish in deep water. So there was a lot of knowledge gained from that pilot project. There's actually been quite a few barotrauma studies for a variety of freshwater fish across um, North America, but most of those have occurred during the open water period. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with the ice, it's a little bit more of a challenging environment for us to do this nature of work. So we really wanted to go out and see, um, you know, could we pull it off? Could we go out and work safely uh, in a way that we could collect some meaningful information? Uh, and the good news is we were, it actually worked quite well. It seemed like the fish that were caught at deeper water depths greater than 30 feet did show more signs of barotrauma. That wasn't a real big surprise to us. It's very consistent what we've seen in those open water barotrauma studies. Um, but we also know that we can uh, modify our scientific techniques a little bit to try to eliminate some of the confounding impacts that might affect mortality. So for this particular study, um, we're using nets to hold the fish because we want to be able to look at these fish after 48 hours and see how many fish recovered over that amount of time. And then also see how many fish actually died over that amount of time. Um, and able to do that, uh, we have to have techniques that allow us to recover the fish. But we want to be sure that the net isn't a confounding factor that's artificially increasing mortality. So we came up with a rather novel approach to test this, uh, where we're taking one net and just releasing the fish directly into the net, uh, much like we did last year. Uh, but we're taking a second net and we're using a descending device to try to rapidly get that fish back down to the depth that it was caught. Uh, there was some concern with the way the nets were designed that it might have impeded a fish's ability to swim to depth on its own. The fish would start to swim down and encounter that net and have to fight it a little bit. Uh, the descending device should remove that factor because the the fish will be um, placed back at the depth at which it was caught. Yeah, another aspect of this year's study uh, is we're going to try to actually use some uh, forward-facing sonar uh, to track some fish upon release and just see what behaviors do these fish show. I got one. He was at 48. Yep. Yeah, that's what Yeah, he's got problems. Tell us when he bolts, Jake. He's go he's under now. He's right under the hole. There he goes. Oh, he floated right back up. He's laying under the ice. I can see him. You saw him? Yep. Yep. He might come right back up your hole. Yep. Yep. He is like uh, not doing well. Yeah. All right, the follow up to keeping fish in the net to look at what the effects of barrel trauma may be on the fish is doing a sample of fish using forward facing sonar. So we've got two teams out here each with an angler and two forward-facing sonar units. So we're set up where when the angler releases the fish, we can watch it with these two different units. And we're gonna collect data on, does the fish go down? How long, it, you know, we're trying to observe the fish for as long, long as we can. And then we'll follow up, who knows how productive it will be, but we'll follow up with an underwater drone and then grid the area. We're marking waypoints where each fish was caught and just try to see if any of these fish are coming up on the surface. And we'll try to look on the bottom, though there might not be enough light down there. Some of these fish are being caught over 55 feet of water. They might not be 55 feet down, but they're in pretty deep water. So we don't know what the light's gonna be like in those depths, but at the same time, we're gonna get a good sense of how the fish are responding. Just to note, this is a private lake that has not been fished this winter. So the fish we observe will be crappies that were caught by the anglers in this study. He was at the bottom, 48. You guys ready? Um, hold on. Yep, I'm rolling. Cap. 
Hey, um, I can't see him anymore. Yeah, he's down. Oh, is he coming? Yeah, there he goes. Unfortunately, um, seeing fish return to depth on forward facing sonar doesn't tell us much about mortality. Uh, we don't know the fate of those fish once they reach that depth. Um, but at least we can observe how they react when they're released. It's a very good tool to uh, kind of observe those behaviors. Okay, so when you pull a fish from depth, um, what you're really doing is you're basically taking it from a, a place where it has homeostasis with its internal gases that are either in solution or not in solution. So that is two different things. One of them has to do with what's called Boyle's Law, which is essentially that the, um, there's a certain amount of pressure that's on gases that are like in a gaseous state, they're not dissolved, and those are gonna expand. So some of those gases are especially present in fish in their air bladder or what they call their swim bladder. So one of the main things that's associated with barotrauma is that that air bladder is expanding more than it should. Um, and that can press on organs inside of the fish, especially soft organs like the spleen or kidney, and it can cause hemorrhage and damage in those internal organs. There's another part of this though, which is that some gases are actually in solution. So like nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide are in solution in the blood of a fish. Um, this is related to a different uh, law called Henry's Law. So in this law, basically what you have going on is that when the fish is pulled out of uh, this high pressure and put into a lower pressure, some of those blood gases may be able to come out of solution. So you can think about this like when you open a, a bottle of pop. Um, there's CO2 that's under pressure, and when you release the pressure in that pop bottle, some of that's gonna come out, and there's these little bubbles or fizzing that happens um, in, that, in that pop bottle. The same thing might be happening in some of the uh, small blood vessels or even some of the nerves in a fish. So that's why you might see fish that immediately die after being pulled up from depth. Or you may see like really severe hemorrhaging um, in like softer capillaries that are in the, in the um, gills of a fish. Um, you also see some of the, that hemorrhaging in the mouth or in what's called the cranial cavity. If you open up the, the fish's mouth and look inside of there, you might see some hemorrhaging in there as well. So there's kind of two different things that are happening physiologically with, with fish. You have this overexpansion of gases that are not in solution, like the ones in their air bladder, and then you also have those uh, kind of uh, uh, gases that are coming out of solution that may be in the blood. Um, those are gonna be, those are gonna vary from fish to fish, so there's no way of knowing um, what, of, what of those signs you're gonna see. Another thing that's not brought up that often is, the, is with um, barotrauma research, a lot of it is actually done on marine fish. So what we under, a lot of that research is based on fish that are at sea level. That might be different if you're looking at fish that are, you know, like where we are right now, we're 800 feet above sea level. And so there could be some variation there. And there also may be variation in the amount of blood gases that you have, like especially nitrogen. Um, if you've ever heard of the bends, basically that's nitrogen that's coming out of solution in people, in a person's blood. Um, and that has to do with how much saturation you have of nitrogen in your blood. And that can vary um, from lake to lake uh, based on, you know, phytoplankton and algae that are, that are in the lake and um, uh, the uh, uh, overall concentration of those gases in the lake. Even with like the bends in humans or barotrauma in humans, the number one treatment is to basically put people back under pressure. And the reason for that is that those those blood gases are gonna be, um, they're not gonna to continue to come out of, out of solution. So those like hemorrhaging type of pathologies that you see in fish, that's, that's not gonna happen as much when a fish actually gets back down to depth um, where it's at homeostasis. Also, if it does have an overexpanded swim bladder, um, it's gonna be able to, you're basically putting it back down to a pressure where it's able to stay down on the bottom. That's why things like fizzing a fish, um, or uh, using a descending device does put them back down under pressure where they can begin to recover. Now one problem with fizzing fish though is that you're actually putting a hole, you're basically popping that fish. You're putting a hole in its air bladder um, and studies they've done with rainbow trout show that it takes about a week for that hole to seal and it takes about two weeks for that, for that uh, um, uh, injury to go away completely. So that's adding another uh, complication into the mix. But overall, it sw either swims back down to the pressure where it's at homeostasis or it's brought down with a descending device um, or another technique, then it's going to be able to start recovering from that uh, barometric trauma. 
Well, we're out here on the third day of our barotrauma study, uh, and I think of the trials we've done so far, this was the most informative. We were able to use several different methods and incorporate a bunch of cutting edge technologies to really try to understand what happens to these fish when we release them after being caught at great depths. Um, we were pretty successful in being able to get a decent sample size of fish. I think the first day we were able to put 100 fish in pens. Uh, and the second day we were able to track about 40 fish uh, on forward facing sonar after they'd been caught and immediately released. So that really does represent real life angling situations. Uh, and pretty much regardless of how we looked at uh, the fate of these fish, we were finding similar results. Uh, so with our penned fish study, what we found, uh, we had one pen where we used the descending device to get those fish immediately down to depth. Uh, and the other pen, we just released the fish directly into the pen as we had done um, the previous winter. Uh, but um, somewhat surprisingly, both pens had very similar results. Uh, it looked like, um, just with a real preliminary count, about a third of the fish that we'd placed into each one of those pens was floating at the surface after 48 hours. Uh, and the majority of those fish were already dead. Um, so, you know, certainly that demonstrates that being caught at these kind of depths uh, resulted in mortality in at least some of the fish. Um, you know, it didn't affect all of the fish. There were certainly live fish in the pens, um, but a uh, uh, percentage of those fish um, definitely weren't gonna survive the experience. With the forward facing sonar mimicking the, the more um, realistic angling scenario, we saw some very similar things. Uh, we'd see fish that were released. A lot of times those fish would initially swim down, but we were able to track those fish for three or four minutes. And after a short amount of time, several of those fish were observed ascending back to the surface. Apparently uh, they had enough energy to get down to depth, but the damage was already done. We were able to come out today using an underwater drone and we actually captured footage of these fish uh, having risen back up and being pinned under the ice, um, both in the nat and uh, with uh, forward-facing sonar. We also documented some fish that died and, and sank uh, directly to the bottom. Um, so it seems like the fate of these fish definitely varies based on the individual fish, uh, but mortality was definitely a factor um, in all of these, uh, all of these fish that uh, we saw either floating or laying on the bottom. Um, and it seems like when we catch a fish, it might seem like it's alive and doing fine. Uh, so it was interesting that that mortality didn't seem to be instantaneous. It's something that occurred over a period of minutes or even days. Um, so just because we release a fish and it seems to swim down doesn't necessarily mean that fish is going to survive. And we certainly need to do a lot more work, um, but we're definitely starting to get a better picture and it uh, really aligns well with other studies that have been done that seems to suggest that once we start taking fish from about, about 30 feet of water, we're kind of entering into this danger zone where we expect angler cause mortality to increase. Uh, once we get over 40 feet, um, you know, we're definitely seeing some real signs of issues with these fish. So we're going to continue with our trials uh, and try to create an even better level of precision um, with our research. But I think our guidelines still remain the same and our messaging to anglers is fairly simple. Uh, if you're gonna go out and enjoy some deep water fishing, that's perfectly fine, but that might be the time to consider harvesting your catch uh, and focusing less on catch and release fishing. Um, so for those that like to go out and enjoy a meal of fish, uh, go out and uh, take the number of fish you want for that meal up to your limit and enjoy that. Uh, once you reach that number, it might be a good idea to head up into the shallows and find some other fish to catch and enjoy.